Let's pray. Father, let your teaching fall like rain, your words descend like dew, like shower on green grass and abundant rain on tender plants. Holy Spirit, take over this time. Thank you for being with us from the time we started to worship you until this moment. Continue to speak to us. What is it that you want to speak to your children? Speak so clearly, O oh God, that they will understand the truths of the living God. And give us all a responsive heart to be obedient and to follow through. In Jesus' name. Amen. On July 14th, 2019, I still remember that day very vividly in my mind. I had gotten notice just three, um, in the middle of that week, before that Sunday, like 11th or 12th of July, when uh, a friend from here called and said, Pastor, would you be willing to come and uh, preach because uh, we need uh, we need you to be here because uh, the other pastor is uh, unable to do it. So I prayed and I sought the Lord and I just came and there was also a process going on here as you all know for uh, somebody to come and help. And I came and delivered a message and I called it leaving a legacy and I spoke on the life of Joshua and I said there are four things that we all can learn from the life of Joshua. If we can live by it and abide by it, we will also be able to leave or leave a legacy and we can live a legacy even now so that we can leave that. And uh, that evening, uh, after the service, when I was there in the fellowship hall, one sister came to me and said, uh, she doesn't speak according to to many people or she doesn't she doesn't have that courage but she just came to me and said pastor you need to come and preach these four points again separately in the future and she just went away and at that moment the spirit of God placed something in my heart and nothing was decided but I knew that God was giving me a clue to get ready. You need to go in and help this church. And your first few messages in the church will be what I instructed you through this lady, through this sister. And the sister is seated here in our message. I do not want to embarrass her by pointing out who she is, but she's here in, uh, in, seated here in attendance. But I want to acknowledge her and thank her for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. And quite a few of you have expressed to me in the past four or five weeks as we've been preaching on this that this series has impacted you and it has blessed your heart. And I cannot take any credit for it because as I said, it was totally guided by the Spirit of God. And so, having given this introduction, last week I told all of you that today, being the conclusion of the series, you all thought that I forget, right? I'll be giving you a test. How many of you remember I said a test? You thought that I just speak some word and sometimes I don't do it? So get ready. Your test is here. My dear brothers, can you please pass it? Can you please pass it? Can I have a volunteer? Yes. You are the volunteer. Can you please? Yes, Solomon, you are a good volunteer. I have more. You need more? Yes, everybody will get one. Everybody is going to get one. If you don't have one, tell me. You have been absent to school for some days. You should actually produce a doctor's certificate to me. In the past seven weeks, if you've been absent, unless you give me a doctor's note, I will let you go. Otherwise, you're going to be graded. 
And some of you all thought that you have an excuse, right? Oh, Pastor, I don't have pen to write. See, you have pens. You have pens to write. Cyril is so joyful. He understood everything that I said. He said, Pastor, good. That's all you need to do. Thank you, Cyril. Yeah, everybody's got paper, everybody's. Anyone that doesn't have one? Yes, Joshua is coming, coming there. Any more? Yeah, please. Yes, everybody's got one. Don't, don't write it, don't start writing the test, please. We are all going to do it together. Don't look back at notes. I look at some people going back into the phone and starting looking at notes. Why do this? This technology is amazing. They just go back and look at all right, I can start looking at it. Everybody's got one? Anybody needs? Everybody's got a paper and a, a, everybody's got a pen as well? Alright. We are going to do this together. Well, nobody needs to write anything. We are going to do it together. And uh, the answers are very simple. Okay, I say there are four principles. Okay, we we'll start with the first one. Um, Living a Legacy is the title of this uh, series that we've been doing. Living a Legacy. Living a Legacy means with intention when we deliver it, what happens is we leave a mark for eternity on this earth. And when we leave the mark, our children, our next generation, people who are observing us, they want to live like the way we live. So what are the four things? Number one, I think you can live with the four main points are there, but we'll slowly write it down. First point right here. Experience the supernatural. Experience the supernatural. Supernatural. And I can, now Yalla, I have not been able to give all the texts that uh, I quoted or that I tried to um, explain during the four, past six, seven weeks. But I have just given certain texts for us to go back. But when you start going back and looking at this, you can go in detail and look at all of the texts. But today we can start with this. We all heard, did you reading this text? Acts chapter 9 verses 10 through 19. Let me talk about this person. One of the persons other than Joshua who really left a legacy in the, living in the first century or the early church. One of the main people that we think who created such an impact, who has given us almost 75% of the New Testament, unbelievable legacy that is, lived, that is left behind and his conversion his conversion is one of the evidences for Jesus' resurrection. Historical resurrection of Christ. So when they say, when people say, did Jesus really rise from the dead or what? So they have several theories that they talk about, disproving and proving. But one of the evidences that history gives is the conversion of Paul. And also there's another person that you want to like, like you remember, conversion of James who is Jesus' Brother, half brother. These two people were against or on the opposite side of Jesus, who, after the resurrection of Jesus, because they experienced the resurrected Jesus, they gave their lives over to him and came into this camp. And they were premier leaders in the early church. And they are considered to be evidences. And that person's name is Paul. We all know that Paul is an eminent apostle who gave us the New Testament and how he did, uh, we all know the story of how when he went to Damascus, he was converted and how he experienced Jesus in a supernatural way. I'm not going to be talking about this Paul. When you are talking about 
the supernatural. Yeah, there are eminent people like this who experience it. But there is this person which if you have followed carefully when the Bible reading was read, Ananias. He leaves us a legacy. So it doesn't matter whether your name is very prominent or not. But many people will not look at Ananias. But look at the text. It starts, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. Yes? He was a disciple, a true follower of Christ. He was a disciple who was following, uh, following God. And uh, Jesus Christ whom he has experienced, he has seen. And what happens is, what is Ananias doing? Ananias is experiencing the supernatural now. He is seeing a vision where Jesus appears to him. In Acts 9 you see the story. So the first point is, we all need to experience the supernatural. We all can experience the supernatural. We can experience the supernatural. And I told you even during my series, one of the greatest supernatural experiences that one can have is the conversion of your heart and soul. You know, my heart aches for so many people, even though living comfortably, who are even growing up in Christian churches, unfortunately, who have not experienced that miracle. Because if they truly experience that, they will be very, very different. Their lives, their values, their priorities, how they live, will be completely different. And what hurts me and what really challenges me is there are so many people who come to church but this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit is the greatest miracle. And are there other miracles that Jesus does? Are there any other miracles that Jesus does? Yes, even now. He works through the natural realm. So many miracles He does in our lives. Very fact, one thing, the very fact that you and I are breathing today is a miracle. The next breath that comes out of your nostril is a miracle. Because you know what? The breath can be stopped. The breath can be stopped instantly. You can do nothing. <coughs> and there are so many needs that our Lord provides. Miraculously. And I would like to share a personal story. How, after coming to this country, how God did so many things to prove that He was with me and He strengthened my faith, especially when He had called me out for ministry. I do not know how many of you all know that I was in the IT industry, like many of you. I started my career in India. And I think I was sharing with somebody here, I do not know whether I shared that. How many of you all have even heard of the computer called AS400? I'm thinking, oh, great, you are my, my level is it? <laughs> AS400, computer IBM system 36, you would not even know what it was, right? Some of the people here, we've seen all of that. The big machines out there in India, I've computers, I work in Monty Lane, and uh, I started my career there, then I continued in Singapore. And then, long story short, I came here, the Lord called me into ministry and He said go into the seminary and study. I can I keep away the details as to how He led me to the seminary. But I was in Alliance Theological Seminary in Nyack, New York. I did not have a job and I needed to continue to sustain my family. At that time I had yeah, three children, my fourth one was not yet there. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I was going to school. And there was this time we did not know how we are going to pay through certain things. And I was in the seminary with my three children. And uh, we were in the mailbox section where you have all the meals for the students. It was a Saturday, I think. So I was, uh, I took the kids with me and I had some classes. And after that I went to the mailbox to pick up some of my papers. And there there was an envelope. And I took that envelope and there inside there, it was in the, at the top of the envelope outside and it was written, God told me, told me to give this to you. That's all. Nothing else. And I opened the envelope in front of my kids and four hundred dollars, just like that popped out. Four hundred dollar bills. 
the kids saw that and they saw what was written and we knew how God was supernaturally providing for us and he has done many things like that in our lives and that is why even when things get very tough in my own personal life even now when we go through struggles we know that we can trust in him because he is going to provide for us he is our Jehovah Jireh he is our provider and he had to do that in order to make sure that I look at him and him alone as my provider and not anything else supernatural experiences are still happening even now you can experience it so what are the three things that we need to do in order to experience the supernatural God now the test begins what are the three things very good you guys are smart obedience risk and prayer obedience risk and prayer let's look at it from the story of Ananias obedience Jesus told him in Acts chapter 9 he said Yes, Lord, he answered, go to the house of Judas on State Street. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Paul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I want you to see how these three things are coming together. You all see him in prayer, he's seeing a vision. He is willing to obey, but you know what? He has to take a risk. See what's happening. He is saying, I heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And I am one of the persons who is calling on your name. If I go and show up in front of this guy called Saul of Tarsus, what's going to happen? He's come with authority to arrest people. And we know that he is a murderer. My life is at risk. And that is what he's telling. Jesus in this vision that when the Lord appeared to him, my life is at risk. But then Jesus replies, go. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. You see how this obedience, risk and prayer is working out? And then when Ananias went, we all know the story. What happened? Then he prayed over Paul. And then after he prayed over Paul, he said, Brother Saul, he said, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you sent me. You may see again, you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Imagine again the supernatural miracle right there. This guy, well, this guy Saul of Tarsus was blind for three days. Now his eyes are being opened, scales are falling. He's experiencing a supernatural thing. Why? Ananias was obedient and he took a risk on his very life. And unless we do these two things, unless we obey the Lord and we seek Him in prayer and we are willing to risk something which, uh, which will affect His name, where God has to come through, you will see the power of God move in your life. Without a risk, God is not going to just throw out His power and say, okay, I can do this, I can do this, I can, I can give everything. No, something will have to be at risk. And one of those things is the name of God. And when you take a stand, you will experience a miracle. Number two, be a soldier of Jesus Christ. We all know that. Be a soldier of Jesus Christ. And we know that he is in prayer. The five indispensable qualities of a soldier. Number one, fearlessness. Number one, fearlessness. Number two, obedience. Number three, Disciplined life, scripture and prayer. Number four, skills. We are given abilities, we are given skills. And I listed all of them there. And number five, we need to know who our enemy is. Enemy. We all have an enemy of our souls. So number one, fearlessness. Number two, obedience. Number three, disciplined life, scripture and prayer. Number four will be skills. And number five will be enemy. Understand your enemy. Understand his limited part, his methods and strategies. Do you see how that is applied even in Ananias' life right now? Fearlessness. He was afraid. Yes, he was afraid. He told Jesus, he said, 
Don't you know this man is in a murder? He is not arrested for anything. And if I go, I mean, he, he can get me right away there. And I am calling on your name. But you know, I mentioned this during the day. It is not being fearless means it is upgraded courage. It's courage. It's courage. having courage. You can be fearful, but when you, you go ahead and still do it, and that is called courage. You take risk. It's not that you have to be completely fearless. Yes, I am afraid. I remember one day driving back from seminary. I can tell you this story because when I experience it, I know that each and every one of us also can experience it. I was coming back and I was afraid, not knowing how am I going to provide for my family. And did I really want to continue doing what I am doing? Or should I take plan B? Should I do something else? And I still remember Charles Stanley came on uh, Star 991 from In Touch. And those, those days they were playing his messages as well. And you know, during the message, not the whole message, just one part, and what he said. Exactly this is what I remember he said. It's easy when you are young, when God calls you. Go on to seminary school or do something. But it's a very, very difficult call when you have a family, when you have children to take care of, and at that time God calls you and says, I need you. It's a very, very challenging situation. And it's much more difficult than doing it when you're young. But be of good courage. God will take care of you. Exactly, I'm thinking, I'm afraid, how am I going to take care of my family? Did I take the right, did I take the, make the right move of going into seminary at this time? Should I have studied earlier? Should I have done this? All these conflicting thoughts were in my mind. But that thought that day from the job by Pastor Charles Sandy who said, Be courageous. God will take care of you. Do what he has told you to do. That helped me to come. God has been faithful, extremely faithful. So, being a soldier of Jesus Christ, fearlessness, obedience, discipline, discipline life, scripture and prayer, this is very, very important. In fact, I would like to know from each and every one of you, in some context, if we can meet together, we can have some conversations. And if you have... Uh, Whichever context that the Lord provides. Because it's going to also benefit me personally. It will benefit other people. We should be able to share how our devotional life is. What are the things that we are doing? How, what are the devotions that we are using? How do you do your devotions? If we can get to that level of discussion, you know that's when we all are going to grow. We as men, as women, should be able to openly share with each other. This is what I, this is what I do during my devotional time. I can tell you openly what I do in my devotional time. What are the devotions I use? And what God is speaking to me? And I can even give you direction. I can say, why don't you try these things and see? And one of the things that has helped me grow is, no matter what happens, that time that I spend by reading and the times that God has spoken to me so clearly, it's not been supernatural. I can tell you I have not heard the audible voice of God. I have heard it once, that's for another time, but I primarily the way that God speaks to me is when I open the scripture, He is directly talking to my context, to my situation. And the Spirit of God says, This is what I need you to take it out. Take, take from here, and this is what I'm expecting you to do. So clearly, without a shadow of doubt. So that is why that time of discipline, time of prayer, and uh, reading the word, reading the devotionals is very, very important. And God speaks every day if you and I are willing to listen. He speaks directly from the scripture. I can keep quoting so many incidents. Where one, the one situation has happened and then I open the Bible and the Lord says, gives me this verse and I have to trust on it, I have to pray on it and I see that that thing happens the next day. 
when he is strengthening my faith, discipline life of prayer. Then of course we, the Joshua 1.8, where the, uh, God talks to him about it, he tells him, meditate on the law of the Lord day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be successful wherever you go. And you will be prosperous. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, we know, be joyful always. Give thanks in all circumstances. Pray without ceasing. What is without ceasing? Without a prayer. Oswald Chambers would write like this. Prayer is like the breath of our, the breath that comes out of our lungs. It should be natural. It should be effortless. Do we, do we have any effort when we breathe? No. Of course, when certain people in certain situations, they have, I mean, they are hard of breathing, they are difficult, but many times breathing is effortless, natural. It should be so natural, our prayer life. It should not be a particular form in which we pray. You can be always in a prayerful attitude when you are walking, when you are driving, and also you spend time specifically in prayer. And then of course ideas, songs, music, scriptures, application, solidarity, then understand that the enemy, we all have one enemy. This is very, very important to understand. We all have a common enemy. We all have a common enemy. We have only one enemy. Only one common enemy. And we need to understand that this power is limited. And we need to know what are these methods and strategies. Then, deal with sin seriously. Number three, deal with sin seriously. And quickly, I said, in order to deal with sin seriously, we need to understand its nature and implications. There are five aspects. Number one is original sin and imputed sin. If you really want to know this uh, in detail, I had preached on this uh, in the month of October, part one and part two, you can listen to them. Original sin and imputed sin, where in Romans 5 he talks about how Adam committed the original sin, and that was imputed to us. And then secondly, when you follow through with the scripture, Romans 5, 18 to 21. Positional righteousness and practical righteousness. What do I mean by positional righteousness and practical righteousness? Because through sin came through Adam, and the scripture Paul would write that righteousness came through one man. And who was that one man? Jesus Christ. And because righteousness came through him, Positionally, when you are regenerated, when you are saved, you are a righteous person, you are saints. When Paul writes his letter, he says, to the saints in Ephesus. He calls them saints. Do you think they were all saints? They were having issues. But he calls them saints. They were regenerated people. So positionally, you and I are saints or righteous people. But the practical righteousness is our responsibility. You and I need to work practically on how to live a holy life and Paul would write in Philippians, Philippians he says uh, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling by your problem take it over to your heart sins of commission and omission sins of commission and omission sins of commission and omission and I have another three blanks, I never gave any proof of that. I'll tell you what was the why. If you remember, I talked about why should we deal with sin seriously? That's an important. Why is sin serious? And the first thing is because it separates you and I from God. Separation, number one. Why is sin serious? Because it separates you. Number two is Savior, right there. Savior is the second blank. Why? Because without the Savior, you and I cannot reach our Heavenly Father. We cannot access our Heavenly Father. Why is sin serious? Because it separates us and it's the Savior who has, who has bridged that separation. Who is our bridge? And number three, very, very important. Why sin is serious? Satan's defeat. Satan's defeat. In Colossians, I've given you the verses. Because all the regulations it says was nailed to the cross and he was made a public spectacle on the cross. The Satan was made a 
public spectacle. So, separation is saviour and saviour is saviour. And uh, the fifth aspect, Christian sins. I call it Christian sins. Very quickly, let's put in the blanks. Hidden bad pride. Hidden bad pride. Busyness, misplaced priorities. Why is busyness, busyness and misplaced priorities are is sometimes can become a sin? I do not know who wrote this, but I remember reading this. Many times we are so involved in the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. We are so involved in the work of the Lord that we forget the Lord of the work. So it's very important that we have the right priorities. Then. Of course, we already spoke about prayerfulness and prayerlessness. Then uh, the other plank is lack of knowledge and overlooked knowledge. Lack of knowledge, overlooked knowledge. And the last two blanks, anybody remembers? Digital sins. Very good, that's fine. Digital sins. That is contemporary. We all need to be aware. It's because of email and Facebook we can tear each other apart. People have wars on YouTube. And that is a platform created for good. It is a good thing, but you know, he always distorts what is good and he plays his part and that's how he destroys. Number four, the last thing be a servant of Jesus Christ. Be a servant of Jesus Christ. And the three principles of being a servant of Jesus Christ. Number one is obedience. You see the theme. Again, Ananias was a disciple. He just had to obey. In spite of the fact that he knows. But still, what does he say? He, he goes. He goes and then, but before that, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. Ananias is a disciple. He you know, I don't know what he would thought, but God is not there. Jesus is not telling him, I am going to use you, you need to go. And though in your mind this man saw is completely not worthy to do anything, he is my chosen instrument. <coughs> and for Ananias to reprogram his mind and say, Yes, this Jesus, this God can work like this. Though I think differently, he can use the worst sinner for the sake of his kingdom. That is why how many of you have heard of Uncle Sam? They call him Uncle Sam. He is in the jail. See the little in New York, I think half 1980s, something like that. He went inside. He was serial killer, I think 11, 11 deaths, if I, if I, if I, I may miss out on the details, I may not be accurate, but the gist of the uh, story is that he went inside and then there inside the jail he experienced conversion, true conversion. And he was willing to reach out to those people, those families that were hurt and he wanted to ask them forgiveness for what he did. And in fact, inside that, he is now a Bible study coordinator or something, and he did something inside with regard to ministry. And he's still like, he's inside, he's a prisoner for life, he's not even outside yet. But he is a changed person inside the prison serving the Lord. So, no matter who the people are, obedience to the great commandment and the great commission. You see this example. Then, second thing, ability. Ability. Natural talents and spiritual gifts. And this is very important for us. To understand. And spiritual gifts are explained in the several chapters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 14, Romans 12 verse Peter 3, and even in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 10 through 12, it talks about it. I wanted to just make this clarification because I did mention that all the gifts are 
in existence and can be used for the sake of the growth of God's kingdom. But in that, in Ephesians chapter 4, it said that when Christ ascended, he gave gifts to the people, to the church, to the body of Christ. And he says, there are five gifts, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, pastors and teachers. And some people use it as five different gifts. Some people say it is four because they club pastor and teacher together. But apostles and prophets, I just wanted to leave this thought with you when you think about it. That role, that office is uh, something that is um, debated in the circles. Because you know many people call themselves as apostle, many people call themselves as the title prophet, bishop. So this is something that I want you to pay attention to because scholars who have researched the scripture says the apostles of the name given there is are those people who had direct connection with Jesus himself. They are the apostles. The word apostle means sent out and they connected with Jesus' great commission when he told those apostles go out into the world. Apostles. Sent out people, and that is the office that was given. So that is why those twelve disciples they went out, and Peter is an apostle. He is called an apostle of the Jew. Paul is called the apostle of the Gentiles. So they were given the title of apostle. So nowadays, when some people use the thing, it is taken into I mean, you can't fully accept it, but you need to um, really think through whether it is truly the same title that was given at that time. And if you put it for the current context, apostles, as you read the word sent out, would actually refer to missionaries. Because missionaries are the people who are sent out. They leave their comfort zone, they go out to a new location. Immerse. That is what those apostles did. So the word apostolos means sent out. So that is something that we all need to keep in mind. So apostles and even prophets. Prophets is something I think. Our church is in a situation where our church is in a position where you want to understand the depth of those words. Prophetess. Okay, are there the prophetical role? Because in the Old Testament, there was a role called prophets. And there were prophets. Remember the king had to go to the prophet and the prophet will tell what the king will ask. Can you please pray and tell me, should I go to this war or not? And the Yuta the Ponoma Yen Kepanga. Upon the Uchumba Rama, you can go or not. And they will obey the prophet. But remember, there's a text in Hebrews where Jesus fulfills all of those three roles. He fulfills the roles. All the three roles are completed. But so that is why they draw that into question. Are there their prophets even now existing? At that time, the word of God was not fully revealed, it was progressively being revealed. But now that the canon has been closed and the word of God has been revealed, there is they say that now what you can call as prophet is not only future telling but it's called forth telling forth telling bringing out the scripture and telling what god has revealed in the scripture that is called forth telling so as a prophet the role i we are not sure whether that still exists but the function or meaning of how it operates that is still in uh, that is still in existence. Why? Because how many of you have been praying? People have said certain things over you and things have really happened. But there are a group of people who always go after that. They only want to keep hearing. Oh, can somebody tell? And treat the people like as if they have to be stargazers of telling you about the future. Instead of not seeking God on their own for their direction because he has said that he will direct us but if God has given gifts to people yes and that will fall under first Corinthians chapter 12 so for because of lack of time I will not go into detail but I just wanted to place this before you so that we are clear in the roles that God has given the church and also, of course we have first Corinthians 12 and 14 and these are spiritual gifts that you and I need to seek how many, of our, how many of us encourage our children to seek spiritual gifts? Paul says, seek the gift of prophecy. Seek. 
and God and Jesus gives gives gifts to everybody. And this is something that's very, very important. We as a church are going to come together as a general body. And you know what? Everybody has got a gift to offer. Each and every one, because God in the Jesus, He does not discriminate between anybody. He has given a gift. And also the other part of natural talents. How that can then be uh, upgraded to a spiritual gift. I mentioned that I mentioned about that last week. So that's something to remember. And then I told about the fact that when you are a servant of Jesus Christ, I told you that the word means do loss. I mentioned that word. Literally means slave. Being a slave of Christ. Doing whatever he tells us to do. And that's why I put it. Obedience, number one. Number two is ability. Number three is obligation. And in obligation, when we are servants, we are obligated because we have received something. We do as the master tells us. Unworthy servants. But Jesus does not stop there. So we need to look at that term in a broader perspective. Unworthy servants moves on to friend, brother or children, heirs and co-heirs of the kingdom with Christ. I've given you all the text there. But I gave you a blank there because I'm going to add one today. And this is something that is so important that you and I will love to be that. Ambassador of Christ. You and I are ambassadors. Paul says in Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, he says, We are therefore Christ, Christ's ambassadors, as though God was making his appeal through us. You are an ambassador of Christ as if God is making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. To be reconciled to God. Yesterday my daughter, Rema, uh, had to go back to school after helping out in the uh, ministry here. But the reason why she had to go quickly was, she was recently selected to be a student ambassador. Why? Because they said that they select a few students who live up to the credentials or live up to the reputation of the school both inside and outside and carry themselves well. They, they are selected to be student ambassadors to speak about the school to other people, to the visitors who come in. Similarly, you know we have ambassadors of countries who go to another nation and carry the credentials and the authority of the sending nation. So, being an ambassador of Christ. Lastly, the three indis indispensable qualities to serve. The three indispensable qualities to serve. Selflessness, sacrifice and suffering. Selflessness, sacrifice and suffering. Without living a selfless life, without sacrificing, without <coughs> suffering, there is no way that you can serve God. There is no way you can serve God. I was in Singapore for eight years and this um, person was a medical doctor who got, whom God called into ministry and he became a bishop of uh, Singapore Diocese. He was a bishop of Singapore Diocese. In fact, he even became the archbishop of, uh, that new, uh, of that area after that time. And he was visiting US one time and uh, because my dad was a servant in Singapore, my father was there a pastor in, in Singapore as well. So we went, we got to go and meet this uh, Bishop Moses State he was called. So I went and met the Chinese person. So I went and I was speaking to him and uh, I told him and that was doing the, I was still not called into ministry yet at that time, I was still working. 
And the question that I asked him was, Bishop, you made such a great sacrifice leaving the medical profession and to come into ministry. And the answer that he gave me still stays with me in my heart. He, you know what he said, Solomon? I have not done any sacrifice compared to the sacrifice of my Savior on the cross for me. What I have done is no sacrifice. And for me to hear that, and then when God called me for me to apply it in my own life. I do not know who God will call from here in this church body for you to experience the supernatural, to be a soldier of Christ, to be a servant faithfully, to deal with sin seriously in your life. I do not know who God is going to call, but I want you to just quietly ask the Lord, spend just a couple of minutes in prayer, I want you to pray. Lord, if you call me, I am willing to step out to experience the supernatural. I want to be a soldier. I will deal with sin seriously and I will be a servant. I know God is calling some of you here. He has invested much in you already. God has spoken to you and He's speaking to you today. Would you please yield? The supernatural experience come a Sada Pramanu experience. Umake, poor Savior Ganaga in the Pavate Mukiavaga Kurdi, Umiano or Uli Karnagan and Yukumuriaga. Jenny, you need to buy a port to the Chulu or the Chulu in the Nadi. Today is the day. If you would want to do it, I ask you to pray a prayer of commitment personally. Lord, I want to experience it, Lord, in my own life. If you pray the prayer, I would want to conclude this evening by saying a prayer of blessing over each and every one of you. If you truly pray the prayer, I would like you to just slip up your hand and put it down. Father, I thank you for the people, Lord. I thank you for each and everyone here in whose heart you are still working. I thank you for those who have truly prayed, O oh God. I pray that you will help them to experience the supernatural in their life. Let their lives not be the same anymore, completely different. Take them to a different level in their lives, Lord, and bless them. You empower them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.